Ladies and gentlemen, Rip Rapson and Gene Sperling. Getting Gene electrified. Um, good morning, everyone. For those of you who know Gene Sperling, you know that electrifying Gene Sperling is redundant. This is, uh, this is one of the most extraordinary figures of the last 30 years in this nation's economic history. Uh, I think you all probably know, but let me just remind you that Gene has served as the chief domestic economic advisor to two presidents. He's the only person ever to have served in that role twice. And, um, and we get him here um, for any number of reasons. Um, Gene was uh, born and raised in Ann Arbor, uh, went through high school in Ann Arbor. Uh, his brother, Rick, is, many of you probably know, one of the great cultural figures of Detroit, having started the Mosaic um, uh, Youth Theater. And Gene also married into Detroit royalty. Um, Allison Abner's uh, father was the president of Motown Records and is, is Gene's spouse. And he's also an incredible diehard uh, University of Michigan football fan, and they just happen to have a game tomorrow morning, so uh, we were able to twist his arm. Uh, but for the purposes of this morning, I just wanted to, to say uh, one more thing, which is that at every significant point of the last decade's uh, struggles in Detroit that Roy uh, talked about, uh, Gene has been front and center. When the automobile crisis hit this town, Gene was uh, with the rest of the administration full front and center in trying to make sure that the response was appropriate um, and, and robust, and indeed it was. And then I, I'll never forget you know, during the bankruptcy getting a call from Gene saying, you know, we really can't do much for Detroit in terms of forgiving your indebtedness or getting anything through Congress, but we would love to figure out some way that we can be helpful to the city of Detroit in this incredible time. And so after a couple of conversations, Gene went to work to do his magic and over probably a couple month period pulled together one of the most remarkable packages in which monies were reallocated, in-kind services were provided, matching funds from philanthropy was put together, and he came back to Detroit to announce a $300 million package that helped Detroit get back on its feet after the bankruptcy. And now... <laughs> It was truly st stunning policy work and unbelievably logistically complicated. Uh, and now he is in charge of implementing the American Recovery Plan, um, one of the most remarkable, momentous um, interventions in the life of uh, states and cities and counties and school districts that our nation has ever seen. And so maybe we could start there, Gene. So welcome. Thank you for making, Thank you. making the time. Um, you know, this is such an extraordinary infusion of help to communities that are really trying to get back on their feet socially, economically, and, and otherwise. But I've heard you say a couple of times that it is that to be sure, but it's also more than that. So say a word, would you, about, you know, what, at essence, do you hope to get out of the recovery plan, and do you hope that communities will get out of the recovery plan? Well, I, I think that one thing that President Biden is so deeply committed to and that we've had to look more seriously at when we've looked at past responses is what does it take to have an equitable and enduring recovery? Mm -hmm. So when you look at the American recovery plan under President Obama, you know, it, it was extraordinary in its own way. It was passed in a month. It helped pull us out from a potential Great Depression, but one of the things you saw was that um, Congress ended up not being willing to do additional funding later for politics and change of political power reasons. Um, things went wrong that you didn't expect in the world. That you know the Arab Spring led to higher gas prices, problems in Greece and Europe affected growth, and so I think when the Biden team was looking here, it was, uh, you know, even for many of us who were on the Obama team, who are proud of what we did, and particularly proud, really proud about the 
effort to save the American auto industry and, and its role in Detroit. Um, but I think that we also know that it, it was not long enough and didn't have enough firepower to ensure that you have both an enduring recovery and an equitable recovery. So just to give an example, during the first five years after the uh, Great Recession, state and local governments contracted. So in other words, they were actually contracting spending for five years. This actually had an effect not just on those cities, but on the economy. So growth averaged about 2.4% for the five years after the Great Recession. Had there just simply not been pulling back and layoffs and contraction in state and local governments, it would have been 3%. So it's not even just how it affected the uh, uh, you know, local government. It actually had a major effect on the strength of the recovery. Um, secondly, uh, you know, the economic numbers you get are always averages. Hmm. Uh, you know, you can say that most people came back. You can say housing prices and pensions went back up. But what that hides is that within that there are people who are, are scarred in a long-term way. They go through long-term unemployment. They go through evictions. They go through devastating things. And they do not recover even as maybe the economy and maybe even as their city recover. So you have to have enough in there to make sure that you're having an enduring recovery and an, an equitable recovery. So, you know, I've, I've said that it's a bit like you want to make sure you also you have like an insurance policy. So when I see the amount going into uh, Detroit and I see how they're using it, I think that it very much fits that model. Uh, in some sense, the mayor is, of course, using it for emergency, you know, stopping layoffs, restoring jobs, resuming the, the anti-blight program, um, you know, things, things where, you know, maybe the good is also just even preventing future layoffs. At the same time, there's enough resources in there and it can be used for long enough that it can lead to both more transformative measures, more long-term measures, and it can offer some firepower. So, you know, one of the questions people said was, you know, sometimes you get reporters and, media, and the media saying, the only test is how quickly did you spend something? Mm -hmm. And when you look at the American Rescue Plan, what, what I think is so right about it is it gives you that flexibility to spend almost as much as you need to deal with crisis, but it also gives you the flexibility to spend that money over several years. You know, we're just in the back room with Dr. Beatty, and he's saying, you know, look at the infrastructure, the, the, the rebuilding. You know, that's so important for Detroit schools, for Detroit equity, for treating children well. If he had to spend all that money in just calendar year 2021, he wouldn't have attempted those mm -hmm. things. So this is both an cr anti-crisis rescue plan, but it is also about making sure you have the firepower for an endurable a durable recovery and the and the and the extra resource that can allow you to ensure the recovery is equitable and you know look none of us know what the economic future mm -hmm. look the delta variant hopefully this is not going to be a major impact on the economy so far it hasn't but but it's the example that things could come up so when Detroit gets its money, it gets one tranche now, it gets another tranche in 2022. This plan is designed, again, to make sure you can deal with the crisis, but you also have the funds to overcome obstacles that might happen nationally, internationally, locally, uh, and also allow you to plan some transformative, equitable things that might take a few years to fully implement. Well, well talk to Nicole Freeman in just a moment, but it sounds like you're pretty high on the approach that Detroit has taken. The mayor has sort of articulated a set of priorities. Some are short term, some are long term. Um, is there advice you would give to Detroit above and beyond what you're seeing, or is it hard to know at this point? Well, you know, you don't like to, to ever pretend you know a, a, a city better than the people running it. I will say in the White House, you know, we, we think of Mayor Duggan as a, as a can-do performer. I mean, we, you know, uh, 
I've had several experiences where I call him and say, um, you know, we need cities to do greater outreach on child tax credit. Oh yeah, here's our plan. We've already been doing it at EITC. We're working with Kresge. Mm -hmm. We're working with Balmer Skillman. We're doing this. Okay, well, great. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, I think like when I when I, sometimes we mention him as the model of doing outreach. That he mm -hmm. asked the question, "How would you build Detroit?" and and did that kind of outreach. Now, a lot of governors, when they got their funds, they were just right in the middle of budget negotiations. So the funds came in, and I'm not saying they're not doing anything good with it, but it just went into budget negotiations. Mm -hmm. So it is, I will say it is exciting sometimes more to see the mayors who sometimes have had mm -hmm. more flexibility or not as constrained by the budget negotiation, or could take the time to do what he did, to go out and do 65 local meetings, mm -hmm. to do a survey, to ask, and, and you know, try to get that, that, um, that, that buy-in. Um, so, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have anything that I would critique. When I look, uh, I think what is good is that he's doing a mix. Yeah. So there are some places where they take their funds and they just use everything to just try to do anything to just store their fiscal situation. Now, I can understand that some, but I think here you see there is money going for revenue loss. That's important. That hurt Detroit under the mm -hmm. CARES Act when they couldn't use it for revenue loss. But I also see funds in intergenerational poverty, internet access, uh, um, you know, things uh, that are, are much more long term. And I see the uh, superintendent who we'll be talking to also doing that same kind of thing. So I think that was what we like to see. We like to see some people using it for the crisis, preventing layoffs, hopefully restoring some of the jobs that had to uh, be lost, uh, but then at the same time also saying there's something special here. There's a chance to do some transformative things. This is additional funds that people would not normally have. Uh, and so let's not just go to business as usual. Let's make sure there are longer term investments that could, that where you could look back and say that there has been uh, some transformative change. And I do think Detroit, uh, to me, represents hmm. that appropriate mix in its overall approach. I'm wondering between the, the sort of the short term uh, revenue shortfall plugging and the long term sort of bridge building, there seem to be a couple of really hard pain points in the middle. I think of foreclosure prevention. I think of the uptake of the child tax credit. Right. Are, are you seeing um, sort of differential progress as you go around the country and how effectively people are preventing uh, people from getting thrown out in the street? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, one of the things for us is that um, we're being asked in a crisis situation mm -hmm. to stand up brand new national programs. and. You know, you don't want to make excuses. You want that challenge. You want to do that. But you also have to acknowledge that you are moving fast and learning as you, as you go. On the child tax credit, well, this is the first time our country, first of all, it's the largest child tax credit, $3,000 for child six and above, 3600 below. I mean, that can be close to $10,000 for a family with three people. And it's fully refundable, every family gets the same amount. So before this, 26 million children, half of all Hispanic and African American children did not get the full child tax credit. This is the first time they everybody gets that. And so this is going to have a dramatic impact on child poverty and opportunity. However, there are four, probably families with four or five million children who just don't seem to file for taxes. They didn't take advantage of any of the stimulus payments. So when you start asking, how do you, do, how do you get people signed up? It's a challenge mm -hmm. and you can't make excuses. You gotta meet that challenge. Well, the first thing we did was do a, mm -hmm. a, a more simple a filing system, yeah. child tax credit. Everybody said yes, but then people realized that because it wasn't in Spanish, because it wasn't mobile friendly, it's not, uh, uh, it, you know, it, it was too difficult. Now we've changed that. We're working with Code for America, you know, great nonprofit partnership that we have. 
and now we have one that's mobile friendly in Spanish, it's simple, but I tell everybody that was a necessary, not sufficient, hmm. because what we're learning is it's not just website inaccessibility. People are not signing up because uh, they're scared of the IRS. Uh, maybe they've been in the cash economy and haven't paid taxes. They don't realize they didn't usually have to. It's okay to do this. Uh, uh, they could benefit from this. They're worried about immigration status. A lot of people think they'll lose other government benefits like SSI if mm. they get this. So this really takes me to a really important point I, I want to say from my learning, and it also relates to, I think, the partnership with, or, with places like Presky, which is in this world of internet mm. technology, for all the things we want to do mm. there, you cannot replace the human touch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need trusted messengers in trusted places. The people, many of the people not signing up really have fears or doubts about government, about the IRS. Some of them may just have you know, learning education issues that make it difficult and uh, to sign up for, for, uh, on their taxes. A real live human being who is trained and is able to be a navigator to help people is a huge, makes a huge difference. And I know that's what, you know, after this I'm going to meet with some of the people who are working on that in the child tax credit. On emergency rental assistance, um, you know, that's something where it's going better than people portray in the press, but not, still not good enough. Uh, today we announced that we had $2.3 billion went out in August, 420,000 families. Uh, we're not seeing a spike so far, but it's a very uneven story. I mean, there are places where they're getting out all of their money, they're working well with their courts, uh, and there's places that are extremely slow. So again, that's another place on the, the averages. I would say at the pace we're at, we might, be meet, we might by the end of 2021 be meeting 60, 65% of the need, uh, mm -hmm. which is pretty significant for a first time program, but cold comfort yeah. to anybody in that 30% who's evicted because you didn't have the programs. But there as well, I met with tenants the other day at the White House who had not gotten their emergency rental assistance. And in almost every case, had there been a right to counsel, had there been an advocate, uh, it, you know, they probably would have. They didn't have somebody to help them navigate the system. So if I was reinventing programs, mm. I would say, when you're doing something brand new that particularly deals with a less educated or people facing economic disadvantages, take some of the money and make a major investment in navigators and trusted mm. messengers. Because what's the good of having the funds if you're not making sure it gets into people's pocket? And right now, people can use their state and local money to do that. And we encourage every governor and mayor. But you know, I know you and I, we did work in great partnership. And you were a great help uh, when we did get that $300 million package and part of the team that came to the White House and Roosevelt Room and worked with us. But so when you talk about kind of where those partnerships are, the federal government is often never going to be able to know mm -hmm. the exact local needs, the cultural barriers, the issues. This is a place people should really, we should really have a more systemic partnership. And, you know, I call them double dignity jobs. You'll create dignified yeah. jobs for people uh, as navigators, yeah. trusted message counselors, giving other people the, 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 the funds they need to have a dignified economic life.